So um, I work for the UK Data Service. And so for anyone who doesn't know, the UK Data Service is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council to provide a single point of access to a wide range of um, secondary social science data. But as well as providing the data and providing access to data, we also provide a whole series of support, training and guidance to help people use that data. So that's part of the reason why we are um, supporting to run this workshop today. And the main types of data that we hold um, come in different forms. So we have aggregate data. So that's the sort of data you'd get from census data or some of the international data we have. Micro data. So by micro data, I mean data about individuals. So lots of that comes from the surveys. Um, and then we do have some other data as well, such as mixed methods data and some qualitative data, or quite a lot of qualitative data actually. But today I'm focusing on the survey data that we hold. So the micro data that comes from UK surveys. So survey data is a fantastic resource because it's been collected in a systematic way. And so it's a representative sample. So we know that the data that we're having is representative of the population as a whole. And it's micro data, it's data about individuals. So bringing all that together, um, survey data provides a very valuable resource that we can use to provide context to some of the work that's going on in our communities. And so I think social survey data is particularly valuable to the VCSE sector because the services within that sector are for the communities and society. But what the funders want is to demonstrate the need and the impact of those services. So they need the context and that's what the data can provide. And the UK data service is the resource where you can get that evidence from. And the reason why this sort of data is potentially particularly helpful for the VCSE sector is because it's already been collected. So lots of third sector organisations, as we've talked about already, um, might not have a dedicated research team or that research team might be one person or it might be the person delivering the service that also needs to provide the evidence. And so if you have data that's already been collected that you can reuse, then that's going to help your services. So some of the pros and cons of reusing data so some of the, the data sets that I'm going to show you shortly uh, would be impossible to create um, on your own as a small from a small resource. You know, they've been collected by large data uh, collection teams. Um, so then for reusing that is very cost effective to anyone doing secondary analysis or reusing that data. Um, the ethical considerations have all been uh, considered already by the people that collected the data. So you don't need to worry about the ethics of collecting the data. And there's no need to recontact the people that were interviewed. And you can reuse the data um, to make claims of your own. So you can use that data in your own way. Some of the cons is, um, is kind of the opposite to all the pros really. Um, you didn't collect the data, so you need to understand how it was collected and why it was collected so that you're interpreting it in the right way. So it takes some effort to get to know the data. And there still might be some ethical issues that uh, limit the amount of data that you can access. For example, we don't often release a data to low geographies because that might make the data sensitive. So you might not be able to reach or access the data that you're specifically looking for. So you might have to rethink how you use the data and how it can support your service. So yeah, the data might not match exactly the research questions or the projects that you have in mind, but um, you can rethink about how that can be used. So some of the survey data that we have at the UK Data Service, just to give some examples, um, one of the big ones is the British Social Attitude Survey. I quite like the survey, it's interesting. It, it, it is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, but different people also uh, put forward questions which are answered uh, within it over the years. It is carried out um, every year and it goes to 3,879 people and it's personal interviews and there's follow-up self-completion forms so that people 
might feel they're able to be a bit more honest in those if they're not asking questions about potentially sensitive issues. And so the type of things that we find from the survey is opinions and views on things like same-sex relationships, austerity, um, Brexit, all these sorts of questions are asked in the British Social Attitude Survey. And the data is collected by NATSEN, the National Centre for Social Research. And this is what the catalogue page looks like on our website. So this is the UK Data Services uh, catalogue. And in there you'll find we've got thousands of data sets and each data set has its own catalogue page where you can go and find out the details about uh, the survey. And I'll show you that in a bit more detail shortly. Um, another survey is the Health Survey for England. So this is a bit different. It's uh, funded by NHS Digital and it's used to shape health policy and improve health services. So it's finding out about the health of um, the nation. It's a slightly bigger survey than the British Social Attitudes. It has 10,250 interviews, but that covers adults and children. Um, again, it's administered face-to-face -face and there's a self-administered questionnaire as well. But they also do physical and clinical measurements and tests. So they actually you know, weigh people that sometimes they take blood samples, you know, these sorts of things are all measured as well. And this is run by NATSEN as well, but UCL uh, work with them to produce the survey. And the things we find out from this survey includes information about obesity rates, uh, healthy living, um, gambling, all those sorts of health issues are covered in the survey. And this is what the catalogue page looks like again. So each survey has its individual catalogue page on our website. Uh, another one I just wanted to touch on was the quarterly labour force survey. Um, this perhaps is one of the biggest surveys. Uh, you can see it's got 69,733 interviews and um, this was for the second quarter of 2020. It's directly government funded and it tells us a lot about the current labour force. So when you hear about unemployment rates and things like that, uh, this is where the information is coming from. So it comes directly from the Office of National Statistics. So it's very pertinent at the moment. It's the survey team are very busy collecting information about the impacts of the pandemic. Um, but generally, it follows things like joblessness, unemployment, redundancies, any changes in the labour market are all picked up by the Labour Force Survey. Um, and that's what the quarterly Labour Force Survey looks like. And I'm going to show you that a bit more detail um, shortly. But just to uh, reiterate as well that we do have a lot of resources and support available on our website to help access this data and the surveys. We have a whole series of guides and videos um, and webinars. So we are here to support you access the data and um, have a look at the website afterwards and you'll find out more about that. But before I go on to show you a bit more of the website and we have a little activity at the end, much like um, Dermot did, I'm going to pass over to Tom uh, from Independent Age, um, who is going to give you an example of how their service has used some of our survey data in their research. So thanks very much, Tom. Hello there. Uh, let me just get these slides up. There we go. I assume everyone can see that. So, uh, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Thomas Wilson. I'm a senior policy officer at Independent Age, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, our project in focus, uh, which we ran throughout a lot of 2019. We published earlier this year, uh, where we looked at using societal data, uh, but also qualitative data uh, through commissioned work. So both qual and quant. Uh, I'm going to talk more about the quant side because that was the side I was more involved with, but I'll try and touch on the qual uh, as I go through. I'm not going to talk about the results too much because they're all kind of published online. I'm going to talk about more about the structure of the project and how we went about doing it. Uh, he says, unable to move his slides. Ah, there we go. So uh, just quickly about Independent Age. Uh, so we're an old people's organization, national old people's organization. Uh, we focus on ensuring that older people have the opportunity to live well with dignity, choice and purpose. Uh, we have a national helpline, uh, including an advice team and a national uh, befriending service as well. Uh, we also have a policy and influencing team um, of which I'm one. 
Uh, so in terms of the origins of the InFocus project, um, we experienced a big, a big expansion of our policy influencing team uh, in 2018, went from about three or four people to about 15 or 16. Uh, so we wanted to undertake a project that would underpin our policy work going forward and give us uh, an evidence base of our own and our own kind of base of facts and figures that we could use to get insights into the groups that we were interested in uh, and that we thought were kind of being unheard. Uh, we were particularly concerned at how 65 plus is often treated as a homogenous group by decision makers and published statistics often tend to focus on the 65 plus age group. It's quite a homogenized age group without looking at differences that might exist within that. Uh, particularly also we were concerned about the subgroups of the 65 plus group being often poorly represented in published statistics. Uh, it's very hard to get statistics on 65 plus BAME people for example. You can maybe get statistics on 65 plus, you can maybe get statistics on BAME but getting them both together is very very difficult all of the data is there. Uh, it's just not kind of published in that way. Uh, and we wanted to look at three key themes that are important to us. So health and well-being, financial security, and social connections. So as the first stage of the project, because it was going to be a pretty big project, so we wanted to make sure it was going to work, uh, we did some scoping. We asked um, the National Development Team for Inclusion, NDTI, to test our hypothesis looking at uh, academic literature. Um, so they conducted a scoping review and literature search, which took a few weeks, and their findings confirmed our hypothesis. Uh, so in academic literature, subgroups of older people are very under-researched, and that the uh, 65 plus age group was used quite a lot uh, in a kind of homogenized way, not really looking at those differences um, between the smaller age bands. And the first thing we did uh, as we were writing the tenders was just... Uh, we've got uh, we've never done it before for a policy project. Uh, so we set up older people uh, to advise them, mostly focusing on the qual side, but easier to kind of get in. Tom, you're breaking up a bit. I don't know if your microphone's become a bit loose. Yes, maybe. Hang on. Is that better? Uh, I think so. Okay, I'll continue. Tell me if there's, a, if there's another issue. Will do. Um, so we set up a co-production group of older people. Uh, they mainly inputted on the qual side. Um, we found them to be really, really useful and the group reported quite a positive experience as well. I can talk about that a bit more uh, in the chat if people are interested later, but it was quite interesting and they had quite a big impact on some of our decisions. Uh, so we put out our tenders and we got bids back uh, and we were faced with some initial commissioning questions. So firstly, academic versus market research. Um, so a lot of our qual bids were obviously market research, but with the quant, uh, we had market research bidders, but also um, academic bidders as well from universities. Um, related question, both projects to one provider or keep them separate? Um, so basically, do we give both of our, uh, both the qual and the quant to a single market research provider and kind of have it all done by one person? Or do we split them up and give one to a market research and one to another market research or, or another academic. Uh, which qualitative research method to use? Uh, there are lots of different ones. Um, luckily, as I'll say in a moment, our co-production group helped us with that one. And the quantitative method, sorry, I've misspelled that on the slide. Uh, the quantitative method, um, should we look at lots of different data sets, uh, so look at hundreds and hundreds of different surveys and try and get lots of small insights, or one deep dive into one very large data set, uh, like the kinds that Patty was talking about earlier. So in terms of our answers that we came up with those questions, um, so we ended up going with a market researcher for the qual and the academics for the quant. Uh, the main reason we decided to go with the academics uh, is partly because um, we'd worked with them before, we had quite a good relationship with them, um, we quite liked their methodolo uh, methodological approach, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, they were also cheaper <laughs> than quite a lot of the other bids, and um, also we quite liked the idea of having a kind of market researcher doing in quant and then the kind of weight of academics looking at our quant, we thought it would give it perhaps a bit more authority. Uh, in terms of our qual methodology and who we went for with the qual provider, our co-production group were actually instrumental uh, because they expressed a strong preference for a particular qualitative method, which was a kind of photography task followed by in-depth interviews. Uh, so that made choosing the provider quite easy. Uh, and as I said, um, we went with that one deep dive into one huge data set, which I'll talk about in a bit. So that's just an overview of what we ended up going with. Uh, so we had humankind research conducting our qual, which consisted of 45 in-depth interviews with some follow-ups, uh, as well as a photography task, and City University looking at our quant, which was a deep dive into the uh, into a big data set. Uh, so the first decision on the quant side was about which data set to use. We saw some examples from Patty earlier. Uh, so we were looking at two other ones. Uh, the first was uh, the English Longitudinal Study of 
aging, Elsa. Uh, we were tempted to go for this one because it is the go-to and quite comprehensive data set about older people. It's a data set that looks at only older people, so the questions are quite focused on older people's issues uh, and can give us a lot of flexibility. But we decided not to um, because of some of the cons. So because it's only older people, uh, you can't get that nice cross-generational comparison looking at younger age groups, which we quite wanted. Uh, and also there were some issues with special licenses where to get some aspects of the data it would have taken us quite a long time to apply for those licenses. So in the end we went with a different data set, uh, the Understanding Society uh, or USOC uh, data set. Uh, so USOC is a giant survey, uh, it's a larger sample size of older people than ELSA, <laughs> including the oldest old, because there are tens of tens of thousands of people who've done in this survey. Uh, the city team had already worked with USOC extensively, so it was quite an attractive option. And as I said, most importantly, it allowed us to uh, it allowed us to look at the same questions asked to older people and younger people, so we could get that nice cross generational comparison, which I'll uh, show you a few examples of later. But we did have to bear some cons in mind, mostly because uh, the questions obviously are not designed with older people in mind because they're asked for everybody, and because the survey is very big, uh, the number of questions asked on each topic is lower than ELSA because the survey covers quite a lot of ground. Uh, the next thing that we had to come to was choosing our definitions of our subgroups and our indicators so that our partners at City University could run the research. Uh, this is, it was more complicated than it sounds <laughs> uh, because each subgroup needed defining within the data. Um, so for example, to take one subgroup, uh, carers, uh, might sound relatively simple, but someone caring for one hour a week and someone caring for 50 hours a week, those are very, very different people who are going to have very, very different experiences of, of caring and their life experiences are going to be totally different. So trying to look at both of them in the same group uh, can produce you with data that's not entirely useful. So we had to break it up into different uh, kind of chunks of, okay, this number of hours caring, this number of hours caring, this number of hours caring, while maintaining our sample sizes at a good enough level that we could get some good insight. Uh, and we had to do that with all of the subgroups. So uh, <laughs> it took some time. Uh, we also went about choosing 17 indicators for each theme. Uh, there was no special significance to 17. It was just about as many as we could get away with. Uh, and that involved looking at a long, long, long list of all of the questions asked by Understanding Society that might cover those theme and basically culling them down to the indicators we thought were most important. Uh, a key learning from us from this project was just because of our unfamiliarity with the data set and of doing this kind of research uh, before, this slowed us down a bit. I think this could this exercise could have probably been done quite a bit ahead of time than we did it, so that was a, a key learning for us. Uh, this is an example of some of the analysis or example of the analysis that came back. Uh, so this is one of hundreds of graphs that's, uh, under, uh, that City University uh, presented to us. So uh, I thought this was quite a good illustration of what we were trying to do. So this uh, graph is showing a kind of relative measure of uh, poverty, essentially, or relative measure of income. So we've got uh, poorest households in red here, second poorest uh, and middle incomes and so on. And over on the left side of the graph, we have these broad age groups, so young adults, mid working age, late working age, older age. <coughs> Sorry. And over here, we have these smaller uh, four year age bands. Uh, I thought this was quite a useful graph to show you because if we look at this older age group here, 65 plus, they seem to be doing okay. If we look at poorest households, they're one of the least likely to be in that poorest uh, households category, certainly when compared to mid-working age and, and young adult. But then when we look at the four-year age bands over here, we can see that this average is actually disguising a lot of variation within that 65 plus age bracket. So if we look at the 65 to 69 year olds, well, they're one of the best off of everybody in terms of uh, likelihood to be in that poorest income group. Um, but then if we look at 85 year olds, they're one of the worst off along with 16 to 19 year olds uh, and one of the most likely to be in that poorest income bracket. So, uh, you know, we were quite happy with this data because it showed uh, or kind of partly proved our hypothesis that these larger age group categories are disguising variation that exists uh, within those smaller age groups. Tom, one minute, please. Ah, okay, thank you. I'll try and speed up. <laughs> um, this is an example of our, one of our subgroup presentations uh, that came back. So this is the without children group looking at indicators for social connectedness. So you can see all of our indicators down the side. The purple bar is without children. The gray bar is kind of all older people average. Uh, and then when there's a black, uh, a black kind of heading, that shows that there's a significant difference between the two. Uh, we really liked this because it allowed us to just kind of at a glance look and say, OK, there's a significant difference here, there's a significant difference there. That's interesting. Let's dive in more in the data and into our qual and look at that in a bit more detail. Uh, we also did a kind of phase three where we took the qual and quant, got them both together, got them to present their results to each other, and then went off and, and gave them some follow on analysis to do based on what each other had presented. This was a, an attempt by us to kind of uh, smooth over one of the problems with giving both things to different providers where they can be a little bit disconnected. So we tried to join them up uh, a bit more at the end. 
And this is an example uh, of what we ended up with in our final report. Uh, and I, I quite like this one because it shows us presenting the different data uh, alongside each other. So you've got uh, the quant data being presented here in kind of infographics and highlighted statistics, the qual in these case studies and quotes, and then our analysis over here on the left. Uh, as I say, I quite like this because it just presents everything together. It kind of highlights the mixed methods approach and it just gives the work kind of a bit of authority and that we're not just making it up. <laughs> uh, we have the kind of uh, both the qual and the quant data to, to, to back up that analysis. Uh, and that's the end of it for me. Uh, hopefully I'm relatively bang on time. Uh, I'm happy. I know I kind of went whistle through, whistle stop tour through there and there's a lot to cover. Uh, if anyone would like to follow up directly with me, my email's on there. You can also find more about our own focus work uh, on the link attached. I think these slides are going to be sent around. And yes, happy to answer any questions in the chat as well. Sorry for the microphone breaking up, by the way. That's great, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to show you now a little bit about how to find some of this data and how to start to understand it a bit more yourself. And then um, much like Dermot said, we're going to have a look at um, giving you a task to try and find some information. So we're going to look firstly um, at the UK Data Service catalogue and then look at the survey documentation and then look at how you can start to explore the data sets a bit yourself as well. So um, I'm going to try and share with you the website. So just bear with me for um, one second, um, this one here. So this is the UK Data Service website. Hopefully you can all see that. When you get to the landing page for the website, the big black box in the center of the screen, that's our data catalog. So if you know what data set you're looking for, you can type it in there or you can type in a keyword. You can also go up to the um, top of the screen to these tabs and you can get data via key data. So that's the big data sets, um, the main key data sets that we hold, or you can look for data by theme. But I'm just going to show you as an example, um, the labor force survey. So this, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the bigger surveys uh, that we have. I'm going to look at it by series because it's a, a series um, of surveys. So this is the labor force survey. It gives you a, a general abstract of it here. And then if you access the data, it tells you all the different types of access that we can have. And I'm looking at the quarterly labor force survey. And it's a bit uh, complicated at the moment, the labor force survey. I mean, it's a very complex uh, survey just generally, but since the pandemic, they've been releasing data on a rolling quarter. So every month they've been releasing three months of data, but generally they do it on calendar quarters. So we're going to look at April to June 2020 as an example. So that's the second quarter of 2020. And so this is the catalog page that I mentioned earlier. So on the catalog page, you'll find all the basic information for the survey. So you see you've got every survey has an individual survey number. It tells you how to access it. Safeguarded means that you have to agree to our end user license um, before you can access it, but that's a relatively quick process uh, to sign up and access data. Further down, um, it tells you what topics are covered in the data set. Um, it gives you an abstract for the data. And then I quite like these bits down the bottom under coverage and methodology, where it summarizes uh, sort of the, how, the key details of the survey and how it was collected. So you can see when the field work took place, where it took place, um, who the data was collected from. So in this instance, it was from individuals as well as households, um, how many people. So we can see that 69,733 cases there and it tells you how it was collected. So face-to-face -face or telephone interviews. The way the labor force survey is collected, they go back to the same people um, every quarter for five quarters. So the first time they see them face-to-face, -face, then they ring them up to follow them up at the following quarters. But every quarter they're bringing new people into the survey as well. Um, and then to look at documentation, that's the second tab here. And in part, I'm showing you the quarterly labor force survey because it is one of our more complicated um, and comprehensive surveys. So there's a lot of documentation attached to it. So most surveys won't have quite this much detail and it can be a bit overwhelming. 
but the things to look out for in the documentation list is things like the questionnaires. So this will give you uh, the questionnaire for the survey. So this is the survey used or the questionnaire used by the interviewers when they go to participants and talk to them and ask them uh, all the survey questions. You can see down the side there's all the questions, there's 223 pages to this questionnaire. So at the beginning when I was saying, you know, how valuable the resource is and how it isn't something that most people could collect themselves, that's kind of highlights that's that point. Um, for example, if I've gone down to main job here and it asks, uh, did you do any paid work in the last seven days? So yes or no. And this working word here, that's the, that's the shorthand for the variable that you'll find in the data set. So that's the name of the variable in the data set. Um, but if you're trying to find what was asked in the survey, I often use the find function. So control F or command F on your um, computer to bring up find, and then say you want to find out what they asked about ethnicity. You could search for ethnicity and it will, it will bring that up in uh, the um, questionnaire and you'll find out uh, what questions were asked. So you can see here, I've got 13 matches for ethnicity and you can go through and find out um, what was asked. And so that's the um, questionnaire and it can be explored in that way. Or we can read through the whole document. The other documents that are interesting to look at include um, the user guides and the technical reports, but this is going back to the documentation tab. Um, the one that comes with all our surveys is a data dictionaries. And the data dictionaries are quite good because they give you all the itemized variables from each data set that you download. It often downloads as a zip file. Um, and that comes, it's not going to, I'm not going to download that now because I've already downloaded it. And I'll show you what it looks like because I've got it ready for you here. So this is what the data dictionary looks like. Um, at the top, it tells you what the data file was, how many variables in it. So in this case, there's 809 variables for those 69,733 people. So again, I find the easiest way to search for information in the data is to go to the data dictionary, um, find something, and for example, use ethnicity again, you select on that and it automatically takes you to the variable for ethnicity and you can find out what's been collected. So that's um, how to use the documentation or how the documentation can be quite valuable um, when you're exploring the data. Um, but then the last way that you might want to look at if you actually want to see what the data tells you is by going to the access data tab so if you go access data, you can add the data set to your account and load it up. Um, or for lots of our data, you can access them online. So I'm going to do this. This is a tool that we've got called Nestar. So it's an online tool where some of our data sets are and you can explore the data from here. Um, the quarterly labor force survey, as I mentioned, it's, um, you have to agree to an end user license to look at that data. So we're not gonna look at that today. Um, instead, if you go up the top, you can see on the left hand side, you've got all the research data sets. And then you've got some unrestricted data sets and some teaching data sets. So the unrestricted data sets are more limited data sets that have been put together just really for the purposes of teaching. And if we look under the unrestricted teaching data sets, you can see there is an example of the labor force survey there. This data is actually from uh, 2015, so it's a bit older now, but you can open it up and it tells you a bit about the survey and then going under drilling down to variable descriptions and household variables, you can straight away look at some of the statistics that are coming out of the survey. For example, you can look at full-time and part-time and main job and automatically it's giving you the statistic for that answer from that survey. So we can see from the quarterly labor force survey for January to March 2015, 30.5% uh, of the sample were working part-time. This is of the people working. Um, and so the other 69.5 were working full-time. But for this question, we've got 5,000 um, 
respondents that it's actually about a little under about 20%, 25% of the sample, um, probably more like 20% were not actually working. So that they are not included in this question. And so you can look at the different categories and um, so you can go to qualification and all the uh, statistics come straight up. Using Nesta, you can also do basic uh, cross tabulation and even some um, regression analysis. So Nesta is quite a nice tool just for exploring the data and looking at some of the percentages um, of the distributions of the data. So what I've shown you here has been the catalog page, the documentation and Nesta. So I'm hoping that you might be able to explore some of that yourself now. So um, again, if we go to the website where we've got all the information for this workshop today, and if you scroll down to uh, societal data and there's the activity down here, and I've put in some links um, for the catalog and for Nestar. And if you follow that through, it's like the scavenger hunt thing that um, Dermot introduced. I've got six questions in there that I'm hoping um, you might be able to find the answers to. So I'm going to give you um, just under 10 minutes to try and find those answers. Uh, feel free to put questions and comments in the chat in the question box. And we'll come back in um, 35 minutes past to share your answers and see how we got on with that. Right, so hopefully uh, you've found some of those answers on those different pages. Um, I realised that you kind of had to go to like three different places to find the answers. So it was a bit of a challenge in the time that you had. But maybe um, put in the chat uh, some of your answers to those questions. So um, the first one was, what is the UK data service study number for the crime survey for England and Wales 2018 to 2019? Um, oh, and that's the not the answer that you've got there. I've got the wrong answer on that page. There we go. Those are around the wrong way. But the study number is the 8608. 8608. So hopefully some of you got that. Um, see, I've got the chat coming up here. Yes, we've got that answer coming through. So that's, that's brilliant. Um, and then the next question was about um, how many adults were interviewed in the survey? So how many adults were interviewed? Hopefully, uh, uh, the answer is 34,168. So that was, uh, 163, that was from right down the bottom on the catalogue page under um, the methodology and number of units and all that data right at the bottom of the catalogue page. Um, the next question, how many variables in the data set? Oh, that's good, yes. Um, and so we've got the same answer here. You'll see number of cases, 34,163. But we've also got the number of variables, which is like an astonishing 2,215 variables. It's an awful lot of variables. Um, but that includes all the derived variables that the data producers would have made. So it's not just the questions asked of the participants, but it's then how they've been used to make more data out of those um, questions. So finally, um, hopefully some of you were able to, um, oh, first of all, I asked what was the variable name for uh, the question about vandalism? So hopefully some of you were able to find that in the uh, data dictionary. And the name I was looking for was vandals. And then hopefully some of you were able to get into Nesta and uh, find some statistics that coming from the survey. And we we're looking at a different version of the crime survey for English, England and Wales then. But you should have hopefully come up with something like this so what percentage of people think that a lack of discipline from parents is the one main cause of crime in Britain today? Um, I found this quite, quite interesting, actually, when I looked into this um, for this presentation. 
Uh, so that's the most popular category for what people um, think is the cause of crime in Britain today. So we had 31% of people thinking that lack of discipline from parents was um, the, yeah, the, one of the main causes of crime in Britain today, closely followed um, by drugs. And then finally, asking people what percentage of people um, are fairly worried about being physically attacked by strangers. And so this was the distribution that we got here. Um, and quite a lot of people are fairly worried, I think. So that's nearly a quarter, 23.4% of respondents were fairly worried about being physically attacked by strangers. So hopefully you managed to find some time to um, explore some of those uh, data set, that data set in Nestar, and that just gave you a taste, just a very quick brief taste of how to find data um, and what you can find out from it. So that kind of brings us to the end of um, the case studies and the different sectors. So we're hoping just to use the last 10 minutes for um, further discussion and any questions that you have that's been raised by all three uh, of the sections. So um, we've got um, the question and answer box so you can use